Hello everyone, I'm Oscar Smith, I work uh, for Julia Computing on analog circuit simulation, and today I'm going to be talking about optimizing floating point math in Julia. Um, our roadmap for today is I'm going to start with an introduction to floating point for any of you who wandered into this talk and are going to be very unprepared for the rest of it, but want to have fun. Um, then we're going to be talking about the core numerical kernels that you use to compute these methods. Then we're going to go into some of the range reduction techniques that make uh, everything actually work out. Uh, and then the, in the last like main section, we're going to be going over what it means to compute error and how to test uh, implementations. And then I'm going to give a brief demo showing how all of this works uh, when put together. So what is floating point? Floating point is the format in which computers store non-integer numbers like 1.1 or pi, and then they also have some other things like nan, which stands for not a number, which they for some reason decided was a type of number, and a negative zero, and infinity and negative infinity. And floating point numbers are stored in a binary scientific notation, so you have an s, which is either 1 or negative 1, uh, times 2 to the exponent, where exponent is an integer between negative a bunch and positive a bunch. And then you have a mantissa, which is a number between a 1 and 2. And this format was standardized in 1985 in the IEEE 754 format. Don't ask me to remember what IEEE stands for, I don't. And there are two main sizes of floating point. There's 32-bit floating point, which has 4 billion values and a relative tolerance of about 10e to the minus 7, and then you have your 64-bit floating point, which has 16 quadrillion values, um, and gives you about 16 decimal places of accuracy. And then, um, due to uh, deep learning and some other uh, things like climate simulation occasionally uses it, 16-bit floating point is starting to become a thing people care about, but it is still very much a niche format and exists a bunch on GPUs, but especially on CPU, it's not that relevant. Your processor, in addition to like knowing what these numbers are, has operations on them like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But that's not really enough because programmers want to use things like um, exponentials and cube roots and Bessel functions and gamma functions and all the other fun math functions you all know and love. And the typical solution to this problem is a C library called libm, which provides a standardized set of math functions that uh, programming languages and implementations can rely on. And this all sounds good, and libms have existed for 30, 40 years, so why are we even here? And the problem is that Every operating system gives you its own implementation of the math library, and they make choices, and they all return different results, and sometimes uh, the Windows one is broken, and sometimes the Linux one is slow, and the Apple one honestly is always pretty good, and this is good for people on Apple computers, and not great for anyone else, because, like, Everyone deserves to get good answers and fast performance not and not be messed up due to hypothetical corporations in Redmond not caring about their math being correct. And then also, there's lots of people in engineering or physics or biology who have models that make a ton of assumptions anyways, and so if they're lucky, they're getting two digits of accuracy, so it doesn't really make sense to use implementations of their math that are accurate to 16 decimal places. If they can use a slightly sloppy version that is accurate enough, they can simulate more and then do more complicated things, and the error of the math they are doing will be um, subsumed by the error of their model being wrong anyways. And so in Julia, we wrote our own. And it implements everything a normal libm implements, as well as some other stuff. And it has been a bunch of work that was mostly done in 2016, and then I've 
gone and updated a decent chunk of it starting in 2020, and I'm about a third of the way through touching everything. And the main advantage of this is that it provides much better cross-platform compatibility um, with a couple asterisks that mainly apply to uh, computers without fused, F uh, fused multiply add operations, which we'll talk about later. But other than that, for the most part, if you do math in Julia on Windows, you'll get the same result as math on Linux and the same result as math on Apple. And this is removes a big category of annoyances and hard to test things that will cause your tests to fail. And there's no really good reason for it. So we got rid of it. So now we are going to go into the meat of the presentation on how to implement actually efficient routines. And the key thing to realize here is that what the hardware provides is what we can use. And this means that division is pretty much out, and if else is, you'll need one or two of them, but you want to avoid them where you can because they are also slow. And as a result, we need a core routine that can be of efficiently approximate functions and which is also fast on uh, a modern computer. And the good news is polynomials mostly do this. They can be evaluated quickly thanks to Horner's rule, which lets us rewrite a uh, n-degree polynomial using only n additions and n multiplications. And even better, for most functions, you only need relatively few terms of your polynomial because with a couple conditions that generally are somewhat-ish true, polynomials usually have exponential-ish convergence. The most familiar type of polynomial you may know is the Taylor series, and a Taylor series has a couple really big advantages. The first one is that you can analytically compute the coefficients, and they're, yeah, they, you just get them from the formula. That You take the derivatives, you take the function evaluation at the point you're approximating around, and then those are your coefficients. Technically, you need to divide by n factorial for the nth coefficient, but that's really easy. The one downside that you'll see is if you look at this plot, which is the rel or absolute error between uh, 2 to the x and the Taylor series for 2 to the x, you can see that the error near zero, which is the point where I approximated this, is really good. But as you get further away from the point that you approximated it at, it's much worse. And so if we want the optimal polynomials, we can use min-max polynomials. And these are the polynomials with the minimum maximal error. And these can be generated with the Remez package, which is which you can or with the Remez algorithm, which is provided by Remez.jl. And these are significantly more accurate than Taylor polynomials, but they aren't perfect because they are a little more annoying to calculate and you can't calculate them nearly as efficiently. So if you need to calculate them at runtime for whatever reason, that's not a good approach. And here you can see the same plot uh, for the error of uh, 2 to the x. And in the orange, you can see that the min-max polynomial has only about half the maximal error. Um, and this is specifically a min-max polynomial over the range negative 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. Um, and that's the other advantage, is that a min-max polynomial lets you choose the range over which you are approximating, which can improve your approximation. There's also rational approximations, which are one of those things that sound really good in a math class. Um, and as you can see, they have like the rational polynomial has about 40% better worst case error than the similar degree uh, polynomial. But rational functions require a division, which is slow. Um, and realistically, that division means that um, the rational interpret rational function needs to be about three or four degrees higher than the pol or three or four degrees lower than the polynomial in order to be worth it and generally they aren't. That said, for some functions, especially if you need to approximate over a large range, the uh, rational function may be more accurate, but in general, you should try to find uh, good polynomials before going to rational functions. Also, uh, rational functions can be generated by uh, remez.jl as well, 
but there are a few issues in the way the library is implemented that mean that it's not ideal for the task. Now, uh, this is my favorite part, which is that FMA is your friend. FMA stands for Fused Multiply Add, and it computes A times B plus C. Um, but critically, the operation is fused. This means that instead of computing A times B and rounding and then adding C and rounding again, it computes the A times B plus C with only one rounding operation at the end. And even better, it's as fast as a multiply on most computers. And technically, uh, Intel managed to release an architecture where their FMA was faster than their multiply. I don't know what was up with Skylake. Someone really did something odd there. Um, but this means that it's really good for polynomials, because if you notice in a polynomial with Horner's uh, scheme, every term is just a multiply and an add, which means that instead of using n multiplies and n adds, you can use only uh, n FMAs. Another place where uh, FMA is really nice is that it allows for a really efficient error correction. So if you look at FMA of a and a times negative b plus a times b, you'll notice that the a times b will have a rounding, and then if you compute uh, that FMA without the rounding in a times b, the result would be zero. But what the result will actually end up being is the error that was created when you compute a times b. And so we won't be covering this much in this talk. Um, but FMA, as a result of this property, ends up being one of the key pieces of how you implement a more accurate arithmetic by compensating all of the error in your calculations. There is one problem with FMA, however, which is that it is very slow to emulate if your processor doesn't have support for it. Uh, and specifically... Um, most libm implementations are somewhere in the range of 100 times slower, um, although Julia's is 30 times slower because we do some smarter things and don't care about rounding modes quite as much. Um, as a result, if you want to write code that will be fast on everyone's computer, um, Julia also provides a function called molad. And the difference between molad and FMA is that FMA will always fuse the multiplication with the addition, whereas MOLAD will use compiler heuristics that are processor-specific and chosen um, at initialization time, or at loading time, to choose which uh, whether to fold or not. Uh, and this means that if you need the error properties of the FMA, you should use FMA, but if you only care about the performance, you should use MOLAD because that will let the process or that will let Julia pick what will be most efficient in this circumstance. And if you get tired of uh, rewriting all of your multiplications and adds to use MOLADs, which is a thing that can happen, there's a very nice library called MOLAD macro that adds a macro named MOLAD you might be understanding why the package is named as it is. And that will essentially let the compiler turn all of your multiplications and additions into molads as it feels like. It's somewhat of a subset of the fast math macro, but it doesn't have some of the other less safe parts of it. So now that we've done the uh, kernels, it's important. we can now talk about range reduction, which is very important because any form of kernel, and especially polynomials, are much more accurate over smaller regions. And if we know properties of our function, we can take advantage of this to reduce the size of the kernel that we need. So for example, for uh, computing 2 to the x, we use the identity that 2 to the x plus y equals 2 to the x times 2 to the y. And furthermore, we can compute 2 to an integer pretty quickly because we're working in binary scientific notation, which means that we can multiply by 2 to an integer by just adjusting the exponent value. And what this means is rather than needing to approximate 2 to the x over the entire real numbers, we only need to approximate over a negative 0.5 to 0.5. And here we can again see what the error 
of the very simple second degree uh, polynomials were on that range. And you can see, like, this is like 1% error, which is okay, but we can do a lot better because we can use table based methods. And these are a little bit iffy uh, because they use up. Uh, uh, they use memory, but if we can store uh, 2 to the x over 128 for x in uh, 0 to 127, that means that we can uh, force the value of y to be less than 1 over 256. And so in this uh, plot here, what you can see is that now, rather than having 1% uh, errors, we have errors that are uh, 10 million times smaller. And how big of a table you use uh, is a trade-off between the number of terms your polynomial has, which is how much time it takes to run, and how much space you want to use. And this is a hard trade-off to make, and it's a hard trade-off to measure, because this is one of the places where benchmarks are lies. Um, but it can be definitely worth it for some functions because you just get such a big reduction in the amount of compute you need. And then we are left with only the edge cases left. And unfortunately, these are most of the time that you'll spend, um, because all of the functions will have specified behaviors at ints and uh, negative infinities, and if there are branch cuts in your function, those will have specified behavior that are not always what your implementation would nat naturally pick. But the good news is that a lot of the time, everything just kind of works. And specifically, um, if you run like a tiny value that would underflow, often it will just end up being zero. And if you run an in for a NAN through, most of the time you'll end up getting an in for a NAN. Um, and so then if we want to know how well we've done, we come to the question of how do you measure the accuracy of your function? And the typical way that uh, we do this is what are called ULPs, which stands for unit in last place. And this is how many floating point epsilons the real value is of the function from your approximated value. And if you are writing um, a library that's going to be used by a lot of people, the error metric you care about is maximum error. Because like, it's no good if I have an exp that is right to 10 to the minus 16 everywhere, except like when you take exp of 2, it gives uh, negative 30. Like that, that doesn't actually help people. Um, and the minimal maximum error for any function is 0.5 ulps. Because if you have like a smooth function, it will almost certainly end up um, being roughly halfway between two floating point values, at which point, no matter how you round it, you'll have half an ulp of error. And then we ask, how accurate do you need to be? And this is application specific, and accuracy always has a price. So if you're doing physics or engineering -y stuff, sometimes it will be worth it to implement a special version of a function that is less accurate. So differential equations.jl, for example, I know has a specialized power implementation that because they need to do some stuff with uh, time stepping heuristics. And the math there is extremely loose because it's all kind of made up anyways. But as a result, they want a really fast um, POW implementation that gives them one or two digits correct. So they have their own implementation of POW. But with Julia, because it's something that we intend a lot of people to use, we generally target less than 1.5 ulps for all of our real functions, and then for a lot of the more important ones, we will give always less than 1 ulp. Um, and this is largely just because exp gets used in things like hyperbolic sines and cosines and stuff like that, and then also the error in these turns into error in your complex implementations. So for the things that we end up needing internally a bunch, we'll generally give you better error. Um, and there are some libraries, uh, there are some libm implementations like rlibm that get uh, perfect rounding. So they are always rounded to the nearest value. Uh, but this does have a noticeable performance cost. And unfortunately, 
because the good versions of these libraries use table-based methods very heavily, that performance cost can be hard to benchmark um, because there's like branch predictors and cache effects that get in the way of benchmarking them accurately. But in general, it's fair to say that if you need um, perfect rounding, that will be roughly a 2x performance penalty. And so then for testing, uh, you can just test exhaustively, especially for a 16 and 32-bit floating point. But for 64-bit floating point or functions that have more than one input, you can't test everything. At which point you need to randomize, do some form of randomized testing and some amount of carefulness is very useful here. And so you generally always want to test your small values. You always want to test your large values. You want to test, you know, 10 million values that will go really quickly. Um, and I actually have a library for this called functionaccuracytests.jl that uh, helps automate some of this. It's not fully ready for general consumption, but it is quite useful and provides um, some nice feedback, which you'll see in the demo. And then the last topic before the demo is we're going to talk a little bit about bit hacking. Because at the end of the day, floating point numbers are just bits. And if you reinterpret a floating point number to an unsigned integer, you can just get at the bits and then do bit operations, like adding them as if they were integers or oring things in or XORing or whatever. And this lets you do some fun things. So the most famous example of this is almost certainly the fast inverse square root. Uh, this was an algorithm that was uh, made famous uh, from the Quake video game, where it, it turns out that inverse square roots are things that graphics functions need a lot. Um, and in this era, you needed it to be really fast, and the accuracy didn't matter at all. So the way this function works involves the fact that reinterpreting a, a floating point value as an unsigned integer takes an approximate logarithm because the 2 to the exponent just becomes linear rather than exponential, and the mantissa doesn't really matter at the accuracy type we're working with. And so this uh, takes an approximate logarithm, it does a bit shift, which divides the logarithm by 2, which is essentially the same as um, square rooting it in the non-transformed space. It then uh, subtracts that from a constant, which is essentially a constant multiply, and then it reinterprets it back to a floating point, which does an exponential. Uh, and the, yeah, also because we subtract it, that turns into an inversion in the non-transformed space. So at this point, you have a we have a very rough version of um, an inverse square root. And then the last step of this is a Newton iteration, which you may or may not be familiar with from calculus. And then at the end of this, you have in a, like uh, five instructions, a um, little more than that, but like 10, 10 cycles, you get a inverse square root that is accurate within 1%, which when you're doing uh, shading stuff in graphics is enough. There's also some other nice uses of bit hacks, such as computing x times 2 to the p, which is very useful when you're doing exponentials, or if you're doing cube roots, or if you're doing logarithms and you want to handle the subnormal cases, it can be nice to pretend that subnormals don't exist with some bit hacks. And then there's also the fun use of wanting to feel fancy, and there's all sorts of uses where you can save a cycle here or there, but this that does get fairly into the weeds of it. Okay, now for a very uh, short demo, because I believe I am almost out of time, um, but here is a very brief showing of how you would implement a um, mostly correct, by which I mean accurate to less than 6 ulps, um, 2 to the x. And so uh, to start, I'm just uh, importing remez plots and function accuracy tests, um, and so then the main function uh, remez.jl implements is called ratfun minimax. It's beautifully named. And so here we say that we want to approximate exp2, 
on the interval negative 1 16th to 1 16th. Um, and then we're going to use three terms in the, or a degree three numerator and a degree zero denominator. And then we're just looking at what the error of that will be. And so we can see that the error of that should be about 2e negative 8. And then we can get the terms from that by taking the first element of that. And I've just converted them to a float32 tuple because that's how we're going to want to use them. And as you can see, these terms are very close to what the Taylor series are uh, for uh, x2. So rather than being uh, 1 for the first one, it's 0 0.9999997. And then the second is like very close to log 2, etc. And then for the table that we're going to use, this is just computing. I've gone with an 8 element table here because anything bigger than that is really just kind of overkill for float 32. So it's just 2 to the x, uh, f or 2 to the i over 8 for i in 0 to 7. And then all that the x2 function ends up being is first we need to get the integer, or how many 8s um, go into x, which is just what n is. And then we're going to divide that by 8 by bit shifting n3 down. Um, and so this is the integer that we're going to take 2 to the power of at the end. And then we want to get the remainder, which will tell us how uh, which element of the table we want to look at. And then we have to offset that by 1 because Julia uses 1-based indexing. Um, and then all we have to do is get r, which is the difference between n, or between the integer size of of x and x itself. And so that's just n divided by 8 uh, plus or minus x with a minus on the outside of that. And so we can just do that with a single molad. And then we uh, do the polynomial evaluation, which is just an eval poly, which uses Horner's method internally. And we have the coefficients there. And then all we have to do is take float32 of x2 of k. And here I'm assuming that um, you have an efficient uh, way of taking 2 to an integer because I didn't feel like writing it out and it would then not fit on one slide. And then we multiply by the big part and we multiply by the small part and we have our function. And to test this, we are using testac, which is stands for test accuracy and is the thing that function accuracy tests, exports, as well as float iterator. And so this is testing on all of the float 32 values between 1 and 100. And as you can see, um, the max error was 5.9 ulps at x equals 63.8. And we can see that the mean error is 2 ulps, uh, which is pretty good. And then I've also thrown up a plot of the inaccuracy. And here you can see that the total error of this function maxes out at about 4 uh, times 10 to the negative 7, and this is relative error. Um, and so this is just a graphical description of what test act shows, although a little bit less rigorous because this is, only, this is plotting far fewer points. Uh, but I do actually think that the graphical approach to looking at errors can be pretty useful, so I've just thrown that there for good measure. Um, and yeah, this is the end of the talk. Um, there's a lot of tricks to get good performance. It only takes one thing that's slow to end up with bad performance for this. So always benchmark. Benchmarks are all lies, but they are the best thing you have. And benchmark more. And if that's not working, write some unit tests and then benchmark again. And if you really want to get into the details, code native can be very helpful. Um, but that is mainly if you are spending a lot of time on trying to figure out why something isn't being fast. But for the most part, just benchmark it. Benchmarks are the one true source of truth. And so, yeah, if you want to have, if you have questions after the talk, feel free to reach me on uh, all of the channels. I'm Oscar D.S. Smith on pretty much all of them. Thank you and bye.